<laughs> we're, we're having our communion service today, and uh, we're going to be in Matthew 26. Um, we're going to be in verses 47 through 56 as we continue with our Passion series. And, um, and so, if you'd stand with me, I want to read from uh, 47 to 56. And it says there, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas... One of the twelve with a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Lord, we thank you again for your word and just ask that you speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So, the title, Victory Via Scriptures. And I would like to draw your attention to begin with uh, to verse 56. And you notice there that Jesus emphasizes that what happened at that time, in that moment, was written in the Scriptures. So written beforehand, it was prophecy. And so in our Bibles that we have in our hands, these things are, are written. And so we can trust uh, the Lord in the moment by moment, the step by step, things that happen in our life day by day, trusting in the Lord moment by moment. Which moment would you not want to be trusting in the Lord? Which step do you want to take not, you know, being confident that it's of the Lord? I know Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So this outward man is perishing, dying, fading away, however you want to look at it. And remember, there is a thin veil between healthy and sick, between dead and alive. And when our physical conditions weakens, we must endure by the promise of the word through the hardships that may come. And so Jesus, he had corrected the religious leaders of Israel at one point, and he said to them, you're mistaken. What did he say to them? Matthew 22, where Jesus answers and said to them, the religious leaders, you are mistaken or you error. You're misinformed, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Well, guess what? Knowing the scriptures, you know the power of God. Knowing the scriptures, you know the, the omnipotent God that we serve. It brings us confidence. It brings us victory. They were... Um, there were many things that these religious rulers refused to believe and they had gotten wrong. And the most critical of those errors was they rejected Jesus Christ. And so you can see here, these are the very ones that brought this mob together to arrest Jesus Christ. They would not accept 
a suffering Messiah, of which Jesus said in John, he says in John 8, 24, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so, you know, Jesus made it clear there wasn't another way, that this was something that was according to the scriptures once again. The religious leaders, they only believed in the second coming promises in the scriptures to the coming Messiah, believing the Messiah would have total and complete victory when he came, which is true. This will happen for all believers. Eventually, we will have total and complete victory, suffering no pain, suffering no, you know, uh, defeats at all in anything because Jesus, we're going to be with Jesus Christ. That day will come. But this is the error a believer can make not knowing the whole counsel of God. They can be deceived. And um, by thinking that you cannot go through a sickness, for instance, that uh, things that are difficult in this life is not something that may be right according to the will of God, you can be deceived. Because guess what? In this life, we suffer trials and tribulations. One day we won't suffer any of it. And that's the hope and that's the promise. And so they taught the people that when the Messiah came, he would just overcome the Roman Empire and be done with. And the disciples, of course, were trained that way. But they failed to know the scriptures as Jesus told them, meaning they could have known the scriptures, but they refused to. You erred. In other words, you rejected the things that you could know. And so, and I would like uh, to make application here for you and me. The Bible is given to us so that we can learn from things that have already taken place. That's what it tells us in Romans 15 for Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patient, patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so this is the priceless pleasure we enjoy, this hope. Now, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is our privilege by the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures. Are you walking with the Lord? Is this your privilege? And so also, of course, in Psalm 119, very popular psalm, right? That the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In other words, you know, if you're if you have the word, then, you know, you're not going to stub your toe. I mean, right here around you, you're going to be able to see. And then also like a spotlight, you can also see where you're headed. You know, which for us is heaven. We're looking for the soon return of Jesus. And so either way, we're going to be with the Lord. The ability to understand comes from the Holy Spirit. Not apart from the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's enabling us to know the word of God. That's why John or Jesus said in written in John 14, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Greek word is parakletos, which is the comforter, the one who comes alongside of us, the comforter, he comes alongside the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And when I always read that, not, not let your heart be troubled, I think, chill out. That's, I can't help it. Every time it's like, chill out. Instead of being afraid, be fearless. 
And why? Because we know the Lord, the living God, who dwells inside of us. Jesus uh, also said to his disciples, which is a word to all of us, he would not leave them orphans. I love that in John 14 also, where it says, if you love me, keep or obey my word, keep my commandments, and I will pray the, the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And I love that because orphan uh, here means he will not leave us comfortless. And then he sends the Holy Spirit as the great comforter. Not as those who have no teacher, not as those who have no guide, not as those who have no guardian, not as those who have no parent. Rather, we do. Because why? We are the children of the Most High God. He has not left us orphans. He has empowered us by his Spirit. It is great to be forewarned by the Scriptures and to be given a heads up you might say an intel. Uh, well, we're well informed at what's going on. If you're in the scriptures, if you're in the study of the Bible, you're well informed. And, you know, in wartime, if one army knows the other's strategy, that's huge. It gives them the upper hand in the battle and more than likely, ultimately, the victory. Well, guess what? We're in a spiritual battle. It rages around us. The devil plots. But the devil doesn't have a chance because what? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That's why we have to be taken out in order for him to accomplish what he wants to. The Bible, you might say, is God laying his cards out on the table. It's all right there. And, um, and then given this understanding, we stand strong as spirit-filled believers against the enemy. And with the insight we have, uh, we're able to be more than conquerors in Christ. We are more than conquerors. And so, um, you know, of course, uh, I'm always encouraging you uh, to the study of the word because I know that um, the importance of it. And um, also, we can um, draw closer to the Lord and have a clear perspective each and every day. And so this is how we know the victory. This is how we overcome in difficult times because we have the detailed plan of God given to us. When the unexpected happens, we're confident by the scriptures. Not because we're optimistic, not by the power of positive thinking, not by man's securities and strategies, but only by the scriptures. That's where our confidence comes, if you know better. So then, how important is it to know your Bibles? It's like, how important is it to know your weapon? People will take classes, how to effectively shoot their handguns, which, by the way, I highly recommend if you have a handgun to do that. I know that we do that when we go hunting. You know, go make sure, you know, you're zeroed in. If you're rifle hunting, that's a little easier to do unless you can take a really long shot. But with a muzzle loader, that's a little bit harder. But if you don't get familiar with your muzzle loader, you're setting yourself up to fail, which I have many times. <laughs> but even more critical, that is what? The archer. You have to hundreds of hours shoot or else you're just setting yourself up to fail because it's very difficult. And they have to practice and practice and practice. It's the same thing. But those of us who have handguns will spend lots of money on bullets and put in the time, hopefully. And maybe, now maybe, it's a small possibility that may 
percentages are against it, they may actually one day, very few ever do, have to use it. For all intent and purposes, to them it's all important being prepared, and I get it for sure. It's their way of thinking for sure. I agree, as a matter of fact. But the same people, Christians, will neglect their spiritual weapon. Uh-oh, what just happened? Ephesians 6.17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How are you going to learn to use that? You have to know it. You have to know him. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And to many Christians, it is unfamiliar to them. The very weapon they need every day, you might say, to pull the trigger. Every day against the enemy. I think that should be a priority. So, I think it's odd, and, uh, but it's a real problem. The vulnerability to deception and defeat. I have said all that because this is why the disciples caved, verse 56, as we read. This is why, unfamiliar with their spiritual weapon, unfamiliar with the scriptures, they had preconceived ideas that weren't according to uh, the word. And so we're given special insight here, especially through Peter. And if you notice, um, let's start with verse 47, and while he, Jesus, was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve with a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So notice first that there was a great multitude. Some say there could be as many as 600 soldiers that could have been part of this. They come with swords and with clubs. Now, notice, uh, you know, whenever Jesus does something, it's for a, a reason. <laughs> and um, and we, we know, not from Matthew's gospel, but we know from John's gospel, the 18th chapter, that something took place here, and that's where Judas, uh, it says, uh, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. I like that added description there. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? And remember when God asked a question, it's always for our benefit. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he, and Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the, gra to the ground. Imagine, imagine that scene, and guess what? The disciples had the front row. The disciples were standing there, and by Jesus saying, I am he, they all fell down. What was he showing them? I have complete power. He even says, you know, whether to call, uh, you know, six legions of, of angels, or 12, what say? Lead the legions of angels, 12 legions of angels. So, you know, this is, what, uh, this is what Jesus is pointing out. Now think about it. Peter's watching, and Peter, the nature of Peter was, uh, wow, you know, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm about. And so about that time, he draws his sword. This is awesome. Between Jesus and I, we're going to take care of business. 
And, and this is what they were trained. This is what they were taught. When the, when the Messiah comes, guess what? You guys are all getting wiped out. That's second coming promise, isn't it? That's going to happen by the word of the Lord. Think about it. And so, verse 51, suddenly one of those, we know by John's gospel, again, chapter 18, that it was Simon Peter having a sword drew it and struck the high priest of the servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so one of those who were Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. That's a heavy statement, man. I, that definitely, it's very important to notice. We see Peter at, at this point, he was brave. I'm up for a fight. And then suddenly, what's happening? And we know from Luke 22, 51, if you read, but Jesus answered and said, permit even this, and he touched his ear and healed him. And so Jesus was saying, God has a different plan than you do. He picks up Malchus's ear. We're assuming it was completely lopped off. Maybe it was just hanging there. But either way, he put it back on and healed him. And at this point, remember, he, did, he undid what Peter did. Now, Jesus told Peter his plans was not God's plans, and Peter at that point short-circuited. Does not compute. Do you realize what that would mean for me? Then the fear gripped him. When he, he was presented with the Jesus way, when he was presented with God's way, he was fearful. And Peter would not accept God's way, and he abandoned Jesus, so did the others. They rejected the word and plan of God. And in 53, or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Well, a legion was 6,000 men, times 12 is 72,000. And we, what, we, what do we know from the scriptures? Uh, we know that the Bible tells us, Pete expounded on this a couple weeks ago in Judges, that the angels are very active. They're in our midst. God utilizes them. We're going to be learning that in Revelation all the way through. The very end, tribulation and on, God utilizes the angels. As a matter of fact, Hebrews uh, tells us in 13.2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And so at any given time, you notice they're, they're connected with strangers. In other words, the angels are passing through. And uh, we never know when we're going to be uh, dealing with an angel, but God utilizes angel. The one account I think of back in 2 Kings 19 says that an angel, well, let me read, and it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians, in other words, the enemies of God, 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, they were, uh, there were the corpses all dead. One angel, 185,000 soldiers killed in one night. So if you took 72,000 angels, they could pretty much wipe out life on planet Earth. So Jesus was saying, hey, if I called, don't you think I could call that? That kind of help? Well, certainly. He says, but, in verse 40, 54, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled but in other words that's not God's plan sure I can keep all this from happening sure you know when you think about it God can stop things from happening in your life but then what if it's God's will to allow something to happen into your life shouldn't we be not my will but your will be done because if then God was to stop doing what is in his will to do in your life then where would we be? God not working in our life? Is it our plans that bring fruit? Or is it God's plans 
that bring fruit. No thanks. I want to put my plans aside when or if they are in, not in unison or in conjunction with God's will. And I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so if you belong to Christ, as one of the worship songs we sang today, then we need to surrender all. Surrender your will and your rights to the living God. I love that. We belong to God. Guess what? That's a good thing. We surrender our rights for his will. Guess what? That's a good thing. And so in 55, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I have, I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled and all the disciples forsook him. And so it's sad they deserted Jesus, leaving him and abandoning him. And then I would like to, to say what should our focus be at the beginning of this new year according to the scriptures? How should we be thinking right now? The Bible tells us we are not promised tomorrow. That's sobering. Sobering thought. We're promised eternity. We're not promised tomorrow. Isn't that interesting? James. Chapter 4. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears like for a little time. Then it vanishes away. In other words, short, temporary, fleeting. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So your way of thinking, if it's contrary to God's way of thinking, then it's arrogance or pride. And the scriptures keep us on track. If the Lord wills, and I'll tell you, that's a game changer to think not about my will, but to think about what God's will is. That's the game changer for dealing with, you know, un the unexpected. That's, that's the importance of the scriptures. And the Bible counsels us not to focus in terms of years or a year, but in a day. That also is God's counsel. This is God's counsel um, who is our maker, our designer, our creator said one day today. And I love that. Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow. He's our maker. He says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to, therefore, to you. For therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about the things, uh, about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Um, in other words, sufficient means there's enough in today. Now, if you do not take heed of that, you're going to be overwhelmed. Because our creator, our counselor says to us, there's enough in today. And so, and so in other words, uh, we are to occupy today and to plan for sure. You know, we can get um, sideways in our thinking, though, and our planning and mess things all up. We can complicate things. How? When we might think of, okay, I won't worry about tomorrow. But what about the next day? And that's where we go sideways. 
Oh yeah, I can deal with not worrying about tomorrow, but what about retirement? You know, what about, you know, the, man, the things men say are so important? I mean, then we go sideways. And so we can ignore, ignore God's counsel, make our own plans like Jane, James warns against, and we can leave the comfort of the comforter. But only the scriptures keep us tracking. And I will, I will say this, yes, we are to plan, but with footnote. The footnote is Proverbs 16, a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And so there's nothing wrong with planning, but know when you serve the living God, he can, he, that's a game changer. And oftentimes he changes things up and we have to be all right with that. So yes, we have a new year ahead of us, but let's keep it simple. Take God's counsel. We have each day to serve the Lord. In other words, separate opportunities, new beginnings, fresh starts. Now, we're going to screw up. But that's why each and every day we have new beginnings and fresh starts. It's a sad concept, concept to think you make a New Year's resolution and then one day into it, you completely screw up, right? Well, next year, I'm going to make another, this time I'm going to stick with it. But see, that's not the counsel of Scripture. That gets you into all kinds of trouble. What is the counsel of Scripture? Well, again, the Bible, the Scriptures will tell us 365 days, or now we have 363 left, daily. Luke 9, then he said to them, he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, in other words, reset, daily, and follow me. Deny yourself. Do not be self-seeking. Do not look for self-fulfillment. Do not look to gratify yourself. Rather, seek the will of God. His plans are always much better than yours. And so we come to the communion table, if you will, to reset and um, to recommit if necessary. Uh, you know, if you're unfamiliar with the way this goes, um, the ushers will come and they'll uh, give you a communion cup, which uh, we have stacked the juice on top, the cracker underneath, and a little piece of cellophane you got to peel off. Uh, but um, we'll be singing a worship song, and whatever it is that you need to clear the air with, with the Lord, do it then, so you can partake of communion uh, in that place of repentance. Because, you know, the Bible does teach us. Otherwise, we'd be unworthy. Well, nobody's worthy of the Lord, but when you come to the table, you're, in a sense, in the correct place to partake of communion if you're repentive. If you're just before the Lord saying, Lord, forgive me, and you're in that place of repentance. And so um, I encourage you uh, to reset and uh, every day, but right now, let's reset in communion and just commit this year, commit this day, our lives to the Lord once again, and because uh, he is faithful, amen? So Lord, uh, we just uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come together and to have this time of communion. And I pray for my brothers and sisters, and I ask, Lord, for uh, just the... Uh, the revitalization, revitalization that comes to us, Lord. You're the one that uh, gives us the strength to revitalize us, Lord. You're the one that uh, we look to. And so I just ask God that uh, you would continue to fill us with your spirit. We take this time now, Lord, just to come before you, to get our hearts right, uh, to be reminded that you are faithful and to walk in your ways. So bless this time, bless your people in Jesus' name.